I'm going to destroy the world in Minecraft Hardcore. Well, not the entire world, just this part of it. I'll accomplish this by marking out the area, digging out the trenches, building a world eater, then removing all the terrain getting insanely rich in the process. How many diamonds will I end up with? Watch the whole video to find out. To start, I need to find a suitable area, which will involve a lot of exploring. This area up ahead should work great. Let me land real quick. This area looks flat enough, so let's get started. First, I'm going to mark out the corners of this area using slime blocks. 64 slime blocks in each corner should work fine. I'm going to have to remove some of these leaves. Then, I pillar up in the first corner. I'll use this as a vantage point throughout this project. This area will be 256 blocks across, so I need to fly 16 chunks before placing more slime blocks. I'm making these chunk borders visible using F3 plus G to make this easier. I also use these chunk loaders to align these slime blocks with the others I just placed. Then I repeat what I did for the third corner and finally the fourth. There we go, all corners are marked out. Now before I do anything else I need to set up a way to travel quickly between here and the starter base. I'll be building a nether portal for this over there in that meadow biome. This will be a staging area for this project. After lighting the portal, I'm going to go through it so that I can quickly travel back to base. After disabling that portal, I realised that I am lost. So, after flying blindly for a while, I finally made it back to my ladder to the roof. So, I climbed it. Then, set up the portal on the nether roof, allowing for fast travel to the new area. So, for this world destroying project, I'd like to break it up into four phases. The first phase will be preparing the area. The second will be digging the trenches. The third will be building the world data. And the fourth will be removing all this terrain. Let's start preparing the area. First, I need to dig out the border of this area all the way down to bedrock. This will contain water later on which will protect the walls from TNT, leaving them flat. I guess I'll dedicate the next week of my life to removing all these blocks. No, I'm just kidding, it will only take a few days to do all that. With that boundary being dug out, I can finally start adding water. I could use buckets for this, but that would take a really long time, so I've got a full inventory of ice instead. Using my fortune pick, I can convert this ice into water. Doing it for the whole area took a while. I made a bit of a mess with the water while doing that, but I really don't care. We can tidy that up later on. Now that these walls are protected, let's focus on these trees. They can't be here, so let's remove them. I could use machines for this, but I won't, so let's remove them manually. These trees would interfere with later phases of this project, so they had to go. Plus, it allows me to see this whole area a lot better. This area feels huge and a bit weird since there's nothing here, but that won't last for long. With that, I consider phase 1 of this project to be complete. Let's move on to phase 2. Phase 2 involves me digging trenches on each side all the way down to bedrock. Two of these trenches need to be 15 blocks wide, and the other trenches 3 blocks wide. I'm not doing that manually. Fortunately, there's a machine for that. Here are the resources required to build it. I've used this machine once before around 2 years ago and it should still work. It's just a simple array of TNT duplers. Now if you're going to build this duper, you can't place the minecarts straight away on this, as the TNT will activate and will have to be replaced. So, how do you prime it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what to do. I add two blocks in the side of the duples, placing an activator rail and a piston. I then add a minecart and power the piston with a redstone block. Then, I remove what I just placed and the TNT duper is ready to go. This is a quick way to prime most TNT duples, so keep that in mind. So after getting those built, I also placed some obsidian at the far end right here so that the machines would bounce back. So the general idea is that the machines would fly back and forth over this area. To get this started, I'm going to flick this lever which enables this circuit to work. This basically means that when the duplers return, they run again. Then in order to activate the machine, for the first time, I press this button down here and the TNT duplers are away. Let's dig this trench. So this first trench wasn't actually wide enough, so I had to widen it with another duper. Then after making sure the walls wouldn't get in the way, I rebuilt the duper lower down and let it run again. I did this several times until I reached bedrock. Then I just had to double check that no blocks were left floating about. You can see looking at the floating obsidian that I had to build those duplers four times in order to reach the ball. Now I get to repeat all of that on the opposite side. The time went flying by as I dug out this trench, clearing all the liquids and extra blocks as I went. Let's just say I'm happy I did those water protected walls first. Now that I'm flying through this trench, we are now halfway through this phase of the project. So, let's move on to the small trenches. Just like with the other ones, I'm using the same TNT duplers but they are narrower since the trench doesn't need to be as wide, meaning that the trenches are faster to clear. The fourth trench was the fastest out of all of them. Now, all four trenches have been dug, meaning that phase two of this project is now complete. Let's move on to phase three. Phase three involves me building the insane machine that will remove all of this terrain. For this, I have two options. I can build the machine I used to destroy the end island, 
Or I could build a world eater. Since I want to collect every ore within this area, the world eater will be the way to go. For this world eater, I'm going to need two shulkers of slime blocks, half a shulker of pistons, and all these other resources totaling 4,432 blocks. Let's go and collect them. So far I've collected all of these items but I'm still missing one thing, coral fans, 41 of them to be exact, which will involve me travelling several thousand blocks to the nearest coral reef. Here's an idea for the Minecraft developers, make coral fans renewable. Arriving at the nearest coral reef, I decided that building a nether portal first would be useful since I come here a lot. I should have done this a year ago. I also went into the nether and built the portal at the right quad that's on the nether roof. Using said portal, I arrived back in the coral reef and I started collecting the 41 coral fans needed for this machine. I'm only collecting the blue ones so that they stack nicely. Then, I'm going to dry them all out. With that done, all the resources required to build this world data have been collected. Well, all except for the minecart size. To save an inventory space, I'm going to take a shulker of iron from the iron farm, and we'll craft the minecarts over at the project area. Now, I can start building this machine. My first order of business is to place down all these shulkers, freeing up inventory space. Now, let's get started. The first part of the machine I'm working on contains the sweeper modules. These will remove any liquids they come across within the marked out area. They will also move down when the machine is activated. This was the simplest part of the build. Next up, I'm going to focus on the activation system at that end of the machine. This part starts the entire machine and connects it to the TNT duplicate at the top through this slime block tower. Think of this entire machine as one giant flying contraption. Unlike other designs, these TNT duplicates are safe to build as the TNT can't be activated until the entire machine is. That is only if they're finished, which they're currently not. As you can see, there are no main carts present, so I'm going to have to go through this entire thing placing activator rails. Then, once that's done, I need to place all the main carts. Now, this section of the machine is 100% ready to go. The only issue I have is that if I activate this machine right now, it will destroy the entire world. I can stop that from happening by building return stations on the opposite side of the marked out area. These return stations are fairly simple. All they do is stop the TNT duplicates and liquid sweepers, push them down one block, send them back, then the entire thing moves down another block. Well, that only happens if you built the entire thing correctly, so I spent the next few hours double checking everything. With those checks being finished, I'd say that phase 3 of this project is complete. Let's move on to the fourth and final phase, by activating this machine. While this machine is running, I plan to collect every ore within this area. How many ores will I end up with? While you work it out, I'm going to activate this machine by removing this wrestle block. And with that, enjoy the time lapse. After only a few minor issues, the machine managed to dig its way all the way down to the bottom. In the process, removing 8.5 million blocks. That's an insane amount. Now, most of those blocks were destroyed, but the walls weren't. I saved all of them and stored them in these chests. So, how many walls did we end up with? A lot. Each of these shulkers are completely full of walls, both deep slate and regular walls. Here's the exact numbers of each one. In total, I managed to save 113,000 door blocks. Now that those walls have been saved, let's tidy this place up. First, I'm going to remove the world and save each of those items. Then, I'm going to remove two of these walls of water. You'll see why shortly. And now, looking at that floor, I need to clean that up. So, there we go. So, with all that terrain being removed and this area being tidied up, I'd say that phase four of this project is now complete. Now that I look at it, this pretty much doesn't feel all that big. So, let's expand it. Let's make it twice as large. So instead of it being 16 chunks across, it'll be 32 chunks across. To get a feel for how large this will be, I'll mark out the corners just like I did earlier using slime blocks. There we go. It's about hard to see right now, but this is going to be a lot larger. I'm going to be approaching this entire area the same way I did with the first perimeter. First, I'm going to mine these walls all the way down to bedrock on all four sides. Then, I'll cover them with water, giving them blast protection. Due to the size of the area, I'm going to break it up into smaller sections so that the world eater doesn't break. This means I'll have to cut some additional holes in the middle of the marked out area. Now that this area has been marked out properly, let's focus on removing it. First, let's work on the trenches. Unfortunately, there's some rivers in the way, so I sectioned them off and drained them with sponges. This is for the smaller trenches, so I cleared the 16 block section of the river just to be safe. Now, let's dig the trench. I've already got the TNT duper in place, so all I need to do is activate it. 
Since I already did a lot of the prep work, I didn't have to clear many liquids, meaning that this trench had ran really quickly. With this trench being finished, let's move on to the next one. This next one involves no rivers, so it should be done very quickly. That wasn't actually the case due to the higher terrain, but I got there in the end. Now, I can work on the final trench for this section. This trench will contain the world there, so it needs to be 16 blocks across, which will involve me using the large TNT duper. Just like with the other trenches, this was a fast one, probably due to the sheer amount of TNT used. There should be plenty of space for the world there. Now that this area has been fully prepped, let's get this world there built. Once you've built this thing once, it's fairly easy to repeat. You just need to make sure that no mistakes are made, as they can be devastating. After double checking the entire machine, I think I'm ready to activate it. Well, let's get started. Running the world eater this time was a bit more problematic. I had to stop it a lot more to fix the sweepers at the bottom as they'd get stuck on occasion. There was also a few instances where some rogue TNT blew up part of my return stations, so those had to be completely built. That's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on going forward. Other than that, the machine ran perfectly. It didn't take long until we reached the bottom. With that world eater finished running, we've removed a further 8.5 million blocks bringing our grand total to 17 million blocks removed. That puts me halfway through this perimeter project. This place is feeling a lot larger now. Just like I did before, I saved all the ores I could and stored them in these chests. Surprisingly, I ended up with less ores than the first perimeter. Rather than showing you all the ores I collected during that world data run, I'm going to save them until the end but we'll add them all together. To save me a bit of time later, let's expand this storage to accommodate the next half of this project. Unfortunately, I don't have any wood on me right now, so I'm going to go back to the starter base real quick to craft up the 20 chests I need. Then, I'll come back to the project area and place them. There we go. That should be enough chests. Now, let's add the finishing touches to the area I just cleared. First, let's tidy up the floor by removing all that lava and those extra blocks. Fantastic. Now, I can remove this world here. As always, I'm dismantling this very carefully so that it doesn't blow up in my face. I'm making sure to save each item since I'll be rebuilding this again. Now that this has been cleared, I'd say that perimeter 2 is complete. Let's move on to perimeter 3. Just like with other perimeters, I need to focus on making the trenches first. In order to do that, I'm removing the water that's currently protecting them. I'm going to focus on making the two larger trenches first. One of these trenches crosses a large river, so I'm going to section it off and we'll use sponges to drain it. After getting that drained, I went ahead and built the trenches. So, now I can actually run this thing. Digging this trench was fairly straightforward as I'd already dealt with most of the liquids when digging out the boundary. In the end, I had to build the trenching machine four times in order to reach the bottom. Now this trench is finished, so let's move on to the second big trench. With that machine being built, let's dig this trench. I didn't have to deal with many rivers this time round, which sped this up a lot. There was still a lot of water and lava here, which was easy enough to remove, and in no time at all, I was at the bottom of this trench. Now that both those big trenches are out of the way, let's focus on the smaller ones, where once again, I'm using the smaller trenching machine. Since the terrain was far lower than in the previous sections, digging this trench was insanely fast. I didn't encounter many liquids this time round, which probably helped. With that trench being finished, let's work on the next one. I already have the trenching machine in place, so let's start it. I technically didn't need to dig this trench due to having all this extra space, but I did it anyway to minimise the odds of the world eater breaking. I'll end up doing this again once we finish this pyramid. All of the trenches have now been cleared, which means I can build the world eater that will remove this entire section. When it came to the placement of this world eater, I did things a little bit different. I placed it a few blocks closer to each of the boundaries in order to test if that would stop the machine from breaking later on. I also did this with the return station segment, and then double and triple checked to make sure that everything was aligned and ready to go. So, once again, let's remove that redstone block and get this show on the road. As this was the third time running this world eater, it became fairly routine. I fly back and forth monitoring the machine ensuring that nothing was broken and had removed the obsidian and other obstacles as they appeared. Even though I took steps to ensure the machine wouldn't break, it still broke several times but fortunately I was able to stop the machine before it blew itself up. That way I could make quick repairs and get the machine going again. I was that busy keeping an eye on things that time flew by and ended up at the bottom of this perimeter. This has got to be the cleanest perimeter floor I've seen so far. One thing I did notice is that I'm missing a liquid sweeper. The return station is also damaged so where is this missing machine? I flew up out of here and I found the missing machine right there. This whole situation reminded me of an issue with the first perimeter I did. I ended up with a missing liquid sweeper there as well. I know what it is though. If we fly a few hundred blocks from here, we'll find the machine right there. At least that mystery has been solved. So looking back to the perimeter once again, I made sure to save all the ores I gathered and have them stored in these chests. I ended up finding two enchanted golden apples in dungeons. That was lucky. Now, let's focus on tidying this place up. First, I'm going to remove the extra blocks from the floor of this perimeter meaning that no mobs can spawn here anymore. Then, I'm going to remove this world here, doing it carefully of course and saving each item. Then, I did the same for the return stations. 
Now this area is completely tidy, meaning that Perimeter 3 of this project is now complete. Let's move on to the final perimeter of this project. In order to start making progress in this final perimeter, I need to remove the water that's currently in the way. Fortunately, I only had to remove the water from one of the walls using my sponges. I then had to wait in the area while the water was draining. Now that the last of the water has been removed, I can start chipping away at this remaining terrain. I'm going to start by digging out the trenches needed for this world area. I'll be digging three trenches in total. I'm going to start with a larger trench which will be located right here. Since there's a river running through this section, I'll spend some additional time draining the part of it that's in the way of this trench. With that section of river being drained, I can start digging out this trench. I've went ahead and built the trenching machine, so let's activate it and get this trench dug out. Digging this final trench was a straightforward process due to most of the liquids being removed before digging this out. Partway through digging this trench, I realised that I haven't collected any ores from the trenches I've dug during this project. I wonder how many ores I've lost so far. While I was thinking about that, I reached the bottom of this trench. That's the final large trench of this project dug out. I'm one step closer to having this place finished. Let's move on to the smaller trenches. We'll do this one right here. I went ahead and built the trenching machine, so let's get started. Just like with the previous perimeter, this trench wasn't technically necessary, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Besides, that's more super satisfying content for you to enjoy. Now, let's move on to the final trench of this project. This trench doesn't contain any rivers, so I got the trench machine built, activated it, and I'm now working my way through this terrain. In no time at all, I was at the bottom of this trench. Now, the final trench has been finished. So after removing the trench machine, I'm ready to start building the final world data of this project. This world data came together really quick. I've gotten so used to building these at this point. I made sure to disable the final sweeping module to avoid the issues we discovered earlier. I positioned this in such a way that it shouldn't be damaged during the process of removing this terrain. But I wasn't so lucky. With the construction of the world data being finished and final checks being completed, let's activate this machine for the final time. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the world data broke every so often. I believe this was due to the placement between the machine and the terrain. Of course I came to that realisation at the end of the project. Since I tackled a lot of the lava and obsidian earlier, I didn't encounter many other issues with this machine. I think if I do something like this again, I'll probably go with a different machine. Maybe that machine I used to remove the end island. Or perhaps I'll design my own world here. It's a fairly simple concept if you think about it. It's just a case of linking many smaller individual parts together. Let me know if you'd like to see something like that. And in no time at all, I was at the bottom of this 512 by 512 block perimeter. This has been an amazing project so far. Now that this terrain has been removed, I need to tidy this place up. Starting with this floor. We've got a lot of lava and extra blocks that need to be removed. That's looking a lot better. Now, I need to remove this world here. Since I won't be using this any longer, I didn't bother saving every item. At this point, it's taking up valuable inventory space. And since it can be crafted easily, I saw no point in keeping it all beyond this point. I also quickly dismantled the return stations. Now that I think about it, I could have used the trenching machines to remove this world eater for me. Words can't describe how happy I am to have this finished. Just look at this place, it's unreal. With that world eater being removed, I'd say that perimeter 4 of this project is now complete. Let's add the finishing touches. Now that everything involving TNT has been finished, I can remove all this extra water. This is going to take a while, so let's get started. Now I have to admit, this wall of water was insanely handy in containing the explosions, but I have to say, I probably wouldn't use them again. The issue is that setting them up is very time consuming. You've got to mine all of that terrain, plug any holes, remove any liquids, and then fill it all with water. That time could have been spent a lot better. Due to the size of the area, I had to fly around a bunch so that the remaining water would be loaded long enough for it to drain properly. Now that all of the water has been removed, I can get a better feel for the scale of this place. This project actually feels complete now. I went through a lot of sponges draining that as you can see here. One thing I also forgot to mention is that I found a music disc as well, which I've been keeping in my inventory for a while. So I popped into the nether real quick to dry out all the sponges and then remove them. Now, let's deal with all these ores. The ores I collected from the final perimeter are stored in these chests. That's a lot of shulkers. Currently, I have everything sorted based on what perimeter they came from. Starting with perimeter 1 on the left, and ending with perimeter 4 on the right. In order to start counting everything, I'm using this water to clear all of the tall grass, giving me the space I need. So, let's count everything. I'm going to start by taking each ore type out one at a time. First, I'm going to be focusing on the cold ore. Let's sort the shovels. I ended up with 56 shulker boxes worth of coal ore. That's 97,818 ore. 
In order to keep this area nice and tidy, I'm setting up a second storage system and we'll be storing the ores I've counted in there. Let's move on to the next type of ore. The next ore I'll be counting is the deep slate variant of coal ore. I ended up with 5 shulkers. That's 7,353 deep slate coal. After picking those shulker boxes up and sorting them away, let's move on to the next type of ore. Next up we have iron. I ended up with 27 shulkers of iron ore. That's 45,072 iron. And when it came to the deep slate variant, I had 14 shulkers of deep slate iron. That's 22,685 ore. Now I could keep counting them like this, but that would take a while, so let's speed this up. Next up, we have gold ore. I only had two shulkers of it, so that's about 3,297 gold. Fortunately, I had a lot more when it came to the deep slate variant. The deep slate variant had 11 shulkers worth of ore. That's 17,710 deep slate gold ore. Moving on to the lapis, I had five shulker boxes of it. That's 8,414 ore. And when it came to the deep slate variant, I had seven shulker boxes. That's 11,539 ore. Moving on to the next type of ore, we have copper. I collected a lot of this, 50 shulker boxes of copper ore. That's 84,019 copper. That's the most copper I've ever had in any world. When it came to the deep slate variant of it, I had 3 shulkers. That's 4,639 ore, so quite a bit less. Next up we have the redstone shulkers. I only had 2 shulker boxes, which was about 2,237 redstone ore. Not much, but when it came to the deep slate variant, I had 16 shulker boxes. That's 26,142 ore. Knowing me, I'll probably never use any of this since I get my redstone from the raid farm. And finally, the most important ore in all of Minecraft. Diamonds. How many did I end up with? Well, I only ended up with one shulker of regular diamonds, and it wasn't even full. That shulker only contained 347 diamond ore, so not that much. But when it came to the deep slate variant, that was a completely different story. I had 8 shulker boxes of deep slate diamond ore. That's 11,779 ore. That's a lot of diamonds. I wonder how much it'd be if I fortuned all that up. So we went through all the ores individually, but how many did we have in total? 100,000? 200,000 maybe? That wasn't even close. It was 343,051 ores in total. That's an insane amount. Will I be using them for anything? No. Will I fortune them up? Also no. We need to do something special with all of these. Speaking of special things, why did I dig out this entire area? Obviously I was after all the ores, but there was another reason. In the future, I plan to use this area to attempt some Minecraft world records. Things that involve me placing millions of blocks. Sounds interesting, right? Well, I won't be attempting any of those until we reach 100,000 subscribers. So, if you want to see me blow some Minecraft world records out of the water, smash that subscribe button. Now, let's do something interesting with these ores. So since these ores are quite valuable, I'd like to build a vault. I won't be doing it out here as knowing me, I'd probably forget that it exists. So, where do I build it? How does a starter base sound? So for this vault, I want to place it against this wall, but we have a lot of junk in the way. This stuff has been piling up for a while now. Let's tidy this place up. I'm just going to store all of this in a chest. I'll place it back here, out of sight. Then, I can remove this stuff. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, let's work on this vault. First, let's dig out part of this wall. This will be the door to the vault. That should be enough space to start working this vault. This door is going to require a lot of redstone. I need to move this floor down 8 blocks. That should be enough space. I'm going to pillar out of here so that I can set up a ladder. This will make getting in and out of here a lot easier. Now, let's work on this door. I've went ahead and collected all the required materials. I've used this design before over on the garden farm. So, let's get this ball. There we go, the redstone for this door is now finished. Now, let's work in the activation circuit. I could use the button for this, but that's too obvious. Let's do a hidden activation system. For this, I'm going to be using a torch key to activate this door. All it requires is me placing a redstone torch over here, which activates the door circuit, allowing it to open. Then, the torch breaks, leaving no evidence of the activation method. Sounds simple enough, so let's get the redstone in place. So it looks like this redstone torch key circuit is working. Let's connect it to the door. With that redstone connected, let's get it tested. So it looks like this door is closing just fine, but when it comes to opening it, that's where we encounter issues. This system we've just installed is broken, so I spent 30 minutes working on the door before I got it working again. Now that this door is finished, I can start working on this vault. First, let's focus on hiding this door. Should just be a case of placing the blocks that were used in the walls of this place. Now, it blends in. I always make sure to test these doors once I've placed all the decorative blocks. Looks like it's working just fine. Since I'm working here, I might as well finish the roof. Only took a year and a half to finish this part. Next, I'd like to work on the interior of this vault. I'll be using iron blocks for this. This looks good, but it isn't anywhere near enough space, so let's expand it. 
With this extra room, I'm going to be replacing all the stone with iron blocks and I'll be placing a lot of chests. With that half done, let's do the second half. Perfect. Now I just need to finish this place off by replacing the floor on the ceiling. I also went ahead and placed an extra crafting table and ender chest at the end of the vault, and I labelled all the chests. With this vault being complete, let's start moving all the ores. Moving all of the ores was a time consuming process, but in no time at all, all the ores had been stored within the vault. So with this project being finished, I decided to tidy this place up, removing all of these shulkers and extra blocks. At this point, I don't think I'll be adding anything else to this starter base. 